When someone asks you about your family, and you're trying to decide if you should tell them the Disney or the Jerry Springer version. And uh, I grew up for that re in that reality. I've been pastoring a long time. I know in 30 years of pastoring, I've done a lot of counseling. And any family on any given day, they got to make up their mind. It's, they're going to flip a coin. Do we give Pastor Todd the Disney version or the real version, the Jerry Springer version? The reason why I picked Jerry Springer, I had this as a trivia question in the first service. Nobody got it. Or if they did, I'm so hard of hearing, I didn't hear their right response. But do you know why I picked Jerry Springer? Yes, good. See, that I knew the intellectuals <laughs> attend the 11 o'clock service. Okay, the, uh, the 9 o'clock service, they're in the shallow end of the pool intellectually. We're the deep thinkers here. Yes, Jerry Springer passed away this week uh, at the age of 79. And uh, I Googled his name and uh, I read his bio. And I was, tell you what, I was pretty surprised at really how accomplished he was. But among other things, he was predominantly known basically from the 1990s on uh, as you know, the host of the Jerry Springer show. And that show basically was it, was, it was set up and it was designed to provoke responses from the participants. And many times they would pit family members against one another. And in some ways, that when you start thinking of the modern family, you start thinking of the Jerry Springer show. And it's almost like a, you got a ref in there, and there's a, it's almost like a WWE match, and, and there's this disqualification, and all kinds of things are happening. And, and when you think of, 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 the, of the modern family, you, you somewhat think about those things. And I thought of the term fractured. The fractured family unit is a term used to describe a family that has experienced significant disruptions, often resulting in the breakdown of communication and relationships between family members. This can occur for a variety of reasons, including divorce, separation, domestic violence, substance abuse, or mental issues. The, fam the modern family appears to be incredibly unstable and increasingly unable to cope with this ever-changing cultural landscape, but the fractured family but the fractures within the modern family are anything but new. So it's just not, you know, from the year 2000, or it's not back just, you know, we go back a couple of generations, and, you know, I'm a baby boomer. I was the last year of a baby boomer. Baby boomers are from 1946 to 1964. I was born in 1964. I'm right on the tail end. Then you have all of the other generations, and each generation, you know, we kind of, we look at the, the, the next generation, the next couple of generations, and we're like, there's a bunch of slackers, a bunch of whiners. I'm sure that the greatest generation, which was before my generation, kind of thought the baby boomers were whatever. And we're always kind of, kind of looking and thinking, well, they're not measuring up. But the problem is, when, it, when you think about the dysfunction and how jacked up families are today, I mean, they were jacked up all the way back to the book of Genesis, and here's where it says in Genesis chapter 4, that it says, Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, Where's Abel? And his brother said, Well, how should I know? Am I supposed to look after his brother? Now, he fully was aware where his brother happened to be. Why? Because he was responsible for killing his own brother. The two brothers brought an offering each to the Lord. Cain brought his. Abel brought his. The Lord was pleased with Abel's, and there's a reason in their sermon, there's the theological underpinnings to that. And the Lord looked at Cain's, he said, I, I don't think this is your best. I know that you made an effort, but I don't think this is your best. You don't have to go away mad. Uh, well, why don't you kind of double down and, and, and just see what happens? But Cain is infuriated. He takes the bait of Satan. He's offended. He's ticked off, and he takes out his rage, his displeasure, and everything else on his brother, takes him out into a field, and kills him. And so we see, like, you, 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 there's enough data out there, and Jeff Myers, Dr. Jeff Myers last week, was saying that surely there is an attack on the family unit today. That being said, you take it all the way back to Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, and boom, we're only four chapters into the Bible and you start to see the fractures. You start to see the violence. You start to see the collateral damage and ultimately the death of one of two family members, one of two brothers. So it goes all, and you wonder, like, well, man, if it happened all the way there and it continues to happen now and things seem just to seem to be, you know, it's like the inmates are running the asylum and all bets are off and you just don't know, like, well, is there any hope? Well, a, a year and a half ago, Renee really inspired me. 
And when we were in Master's Commission, we used to get little books like this, and we had to write down 400 scriptures, and we would memorize them. And I think I've told you the story that I, I wanted to do more than that. And, you know, firstborn, I read that firstborn book, you know, overachievers. And, but yet at the same time, this, they walk around with a pathetic perspective of themselves, and I'm classically that all the way. But I, I'm like, I want to learn more than that. And I memorized my scriptures, and I think I told you, it, because it was the grace of God that allowed me to do this. But in 1993, I had 525 uh, scriptures memorized. And I made, a, I made a New Year's resolution of a goal to review them all every day the entire year without missing one day. And it would take me two hours at a minimum. And I, I made the entire 1993. So Because I wanted the word of God really in me. But I really haven't written down very many scriptures since then. So about two years ago... Renee, I would wake up in the morning and she would already be up and she would be sitting in our chair, in the chair in our master bedroom writing down scriptures on cards. And I'm like, how dare she? I'm Pastor Todd. She cannot be out in front of me. And that, that holy competitive spirit that men have, no, it's not holy. It's unholy. But I'm like, I'll show her. I'll go out and get a little black book myself and start writing down scriptures again. Actually, I really have to commend, commend my wife because, you know, husbands and wives ultimately have been designed to bring the best out of one another. And she, she reminded me this was a, a valuable practice then. So I started writing down some scriptures and I wrote down this scripture and I asked Siri yesterday because I wrote it down because I, I write dates down on October the 2nd, 2021. So yesterday I was like, Siri, how many days since October the 2nd, 2021? 574. So today is 575. So 575 days ago, I wrote down a scripture on the very first page of this that I'm going to use today. And I just want to say that in passing, that sometimes God will share something with you now that's not intended for now. God will share or speak something into your life today that may be meant to play into your life, maybe not even tomorrow, maybe even not next year, maybe it's 575. God gave me this 575 days ago, not knowing that I would, he reminded me of it this week. And here's what it says in Psalms 22. It says, from the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses. They're running back to God. Look at this, long lost families are falling on their faces before him. God has taken charge from now on. He has the last word. And when I started thinking about the modern family, and I thought, gosh, I mean, all the way back in the book of Genesis, and here is Adam, or here, here, here is Cain killing Abel, and my goodness, and they had it pretty set up and, and pretty locked in, and he still took the life of his brother. Is there any hope, you know, for the modern family today and in church families today? And God gave me this scripture then knowing that I would be speaking on this subject today because there's something about it that gripped me then, that's gripped me again today, that it's just like from every direction, families that are lost, families that are fractured, families that are falling apart at the seams, families that are messed up and jacked up and tweaked up and whatever up and are about to give up, they're going to have an epiphany, they're going to have an opportunity to come to their senses and they're going to come back to God. And God, in that setting, is going to remind them that he has the last word. And listen, I mean, there can be all kinds of statistics, all kinds of trends, all kinds of opinions that your family's not going to last. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. You may as well give up. You may as well fall on your sword like Saul did in 1 Samuel chapter 31 and just say, I, I have no more fight in me. But the word of God says long lost families are going to come from, and I believe that relates to family members, just not entire family units. And how many people would say here today that I've got a family member, member a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a son or a daughter, a grandson or a grand, granddaughter, a grandmother or a grandfather, a cousin or a relative, somebody that's far from God, and I'm believing that they're going to, they, though they may be far, they're going to come back to God. Amen. And my hand is raised as well. I've got family members that are in that camp, and I get it. Reading on in the same chapter, it says, All the power mongers are before him worshiping. All the poor and the powerless, they're worshiping. Along with those who never got it together, they're worshiping. Then it goes on to say, Our children and their children will get, on, get in on this as this word is passed along from parent to child, 
Babies not yet conceived will hear the good news and that what God does, what he says. And that's the hope that I have as a parent. That's the hope that I now have as a grandparent. I'm passing it on to my kids and now my, my grandson, and there's, I'm sure there's going to be more coming uh, in due time. Hallelujah. In due time. In due time. And But th- this is the hope that I have and that all of us can find a place, no matter what our station, our stage, or age in this life, that we're going to be found in worship. All of us are worshiping together. And I love it where it says that who never got it together. Well, I'm a guy at the front of that line. I've never gotten it together. But God's never asked me to get it together. He's not asking you to get it. He's just asking you to give what you got to him. And you just bring what you got to him and give it to him. It's in the presence of God that ignites the promises of God within the child of God that ultimately keeps that child and family on the road that leads to life. And so, in conclusion, see, I told you, I'm not going to preach very long. Michael, why don't you come on back to the keyboard at this time? I just like, I miss Michael. And he plays at different churches and stuff, so he, he's been very, very busy. But he's going to pop out here, because remember back in the day when he was playing here every week, he would pop out, and we would always applaud when he would plop back out. I said we would always applaud Okay, when he comes out, I want to flat out boo him. (laughs) Michael! (laughs) Well, I'm going to keep going. Amen. Yeah. (laughs) I'm early. I'm early. It's not you. This is George Costanza here. It's not you. It's me. Any Seinfeld fans other than John Libby can appreciate that quote. It's not you. It's me. I got to get one of those t-shirts. So I, I want to conclude this morning by talking about Abraham. And I don't know if you grew up in, in, in a church or that had a Sunday school and they used to have those songs. And see if you remember this one. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. So will you. So let's just praise the Lord. Left hand, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right hand, well, forget it. I'm not coordinated enough. Amen. Why did we sing that? Just to kind of, you know, get the kids off their sugar high and get them calmed down before the Bible lesson? No, because the Bible tells us that Abraham is the father of us all in terms of our faith number of times, Paul really unpacks that deeply. That's not my intent today. You might say, well, I don't, I don't wait, 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 wait a minute. Abraham, he's, you know, he's the father, father of the Jews and uh, born in Palestine and, you know, goes to the promised land and, or he's, he promised the promised land and, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm Gentile. I was born in uh, Waxahachie, Texas. How is he my father? American? And, you know, no. By faith, we are the seed of Abraham. And I thought about where it says that, that God does what he, he, what he says he's going to do. And as we talk about the modern family, I thought, let's go back to the father of our faith and look at his example. And that's where I want to end up today very, very quickly. How many people will give me five more minutes? I'm going to do a Tommy Barnett. Five more minutes. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. It's a Tommy Barnett joke. Amen. Romans chapter 4, 18. It says, we call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many people. Abraham was the first named father and then became a father because he dared, notice this, he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life, and with a word, make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Deciding not to live on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. Abraham was almost 100 years old, so he was past the age of having children. Also, Sarah could not have children. And Abraham, he wasn't 
He wasn't naive. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, ignorance wasn't bliss that says that he was well aware of this. He's like, I get it. I'm looking at me. I'm looking at you. I don't see how this is going to work. But his faith in God never became weak. But this is my favorite part. And I, I love it how it, it, it's brought out in the Amplified. It says, no unbelief or tr- distrust made him waver, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. But I love how this is phrased. And this is what grips my heart and captures my attention. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Being fully convinced that what he had promised, God was able to perform. Here's Abraham. He's knocking on the door of a hundred. His wife, it's not that he married young. She was 90. She was 10 years younger than he was. So, I mean, he's looking at her. He's looking at himself. It's like, man, I don't know. And yet, and yet, instead of having that promise diminish and begin to wither on the vine internally, it says that his faith, in contrast to what you would normally expect, grew stronger. As time went by, as the days fell off the calendar, and he's getting older, and he's turning 90, 91, 92, 93, 90, and it's, it's cranking, man, in the wrong direction. His faith, instead of growing weaker, grew stronger as he gave praise and glory to God. And man, that's the exception to the rule, because many of us, when God gives us a word, when God gives us a dream, when God gives us a hope, when he paints a picture within our mind or in our imagination of the potential of the horizon of the things that are out there, that he's like, I've got this for you. This is waiting on you. As time goes by, many times that picture becomes ever increasingly blurry. It's like, I don't know what I'm looking at anymore. I believe the opposite was true with Abraham. I believe it came clearer and clearer and clearer into focus. He's like, I'm not about to give up on this. Look at this thing. This is the promise that God has given me. But that happened. That when he found himself in that in-between period between the promise and the promise coming to pass, that waiting room of the Lord, what did he do in the waiting room? He worshiped. Worshiped. He worshiped. I typically, that's not my default. I worry. I stress. I doubt. I complain. I get distracted. I get discouraged. I'm like, forget it. And I start to forget what God has said, and I focus on, well, and I shared in the first service, I'll be 59 in June, and I've seen a lot of promises and a lot of dreams come to pass, but I've got other dreams that are just, and they're not dreams of recent. They're not in the last year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, decade-long dreams. And I thought, man, well, I'll probably realize these things before I'm 40, surely before I'm 50, and now I'm knocking on the door of 60. And I, whoa, 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 whoa. And I and I'm, I'm confessing this to you. I have found myself recently becoming more preoccupied with the passing of time. I think, oh, well, God, I don't, I don't know how much time I got to, to fulfill that, to be that, to become that, to do that. Why would you ever show that to me or speak that to me if I'm not going to have the energy or the strength or the life or the desire or the passion or the sense of comfort? And just to, why, why would, why? But God knew exactly what he was doing when he showed it to me. And I shared in the first service six years ago Go ahead and stand with me at this time. Six years ago, Pastor Tommy Barnett came to my church in Indiana. It was our 100th year anniversary, seven years ago. And uh, on that Sunday morning, in the second service, he stops the service. And for those that are visiting, Pastor Tommy is like the founding pastor of Dream City Church. Now Pastor Lucas, the senior pastor. And uh, Pastor Tommy is my mentor He's my spiritual father. 
he's, he's the guy in my life. When, when I hit a crisis and I pick up the phone, I send up the bat signal, Tommy Barnett shows up in the Batmobile. And by the way, he sounds a lot like Christian Bale in The Dark Knight. Todd, Tommy Barnett calling. That's exactly how he sounds. So, seven years ago, in the second service, he stops the service and he calls Renee and I up on the stage. And I mean, the guy is the biggest encourager in the world, but he says, in 63 years of ministry, he said, I've only done this one other time. And he takes off his watch. It's not this watch. I didn't think to wear it today. He takes off his watch and he says, Todd, I've only done this one other time in 63 years. And he said, this is a modern day mantle. I'm praying my mantle on you. So after the service, Gary Blair, who is his traveling assistant, Pastor Gary, takes me aside. He's like, Todd, I don't think you get it. I said, what? He said, you, you don't get it. I said, I know you don't. He said, in 22 years of traveling with Pastor Tommy, he said, not in one service at one time has he ever done what he did for you today. He said, you don't know how sacred and how special what he just did. So I got thinking about that this morning. I didn't, I didn't think it before this week, but it hit me in the first service. Pastor Barnett is 85. And I mean, he's still swinging for the fences. Caleb, in Joshua chapter 14, when he's about to basically realize God's promise for his life that God gave him 40 years earlier, was 85. While I was worshiping at the conclusion of the first service, these were my closing remarks. I put it in my heart, and I'm going to declare it for the Lord. I, I don't want it to be this way. But if it takes me until I am 85 to say, now give me this mountain like Caleb did, and Tommy Barnett just happens to be 85 right now, and he gave me that watch seven years ago and prayed his mantle on me, and I believe God has given me supernatural energy and, and drive and just... I, I don't claim it's mine, but I got it. it, it it's, it's, it's in me and it's on me. So I don't know, I don't know when those pictures that are on my spirit and in my mind to this day that are still burning brightly from 20, 30 years ago. I don't know when they're going to come to pass. I don't know when they're going to come into fruition. I don't know when that's going to break through. But I'm going to praise, and I'm going to worship, and I'm going to give God. I'm going to give God glory between now and then. And instead of having that picture fade and recess into the shadows, I'm going to praise Him so that picture becomes clearer and closer in my spirit. And if you read in Hebrews chapter 11, it says they saw. No, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 11 or 12. It says, though they saw those things from afar, and they embraced them today. So I don't know how far away. I don't know how long it will be that I'm going to embrace them today, and I'm going to hold them today. But the only way that I'm going to keep on holding them, the only way that you're going to keep on holding them, we got to follow Abraham's example. He grew stronger, and he became empowered in his faith, as he praised and gave glory to God. It may be a million miles away. It may be a decade away. I'm going to be 59, so if I'm 85, that's 26 more years away, but I'm going to praise him for the next 26 years. I'm going to give him glory for the next 26 years because we're going to sing this song again that God is able. That's the only one I want to do. I want to do the God is able song because it says in Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask, think, dream, or imagine, he's able. He's able. He's able. We got to get back to the place where we are sure that he is able. And by the way, but it needs to be unconditional. What? Because the three Hebrew children said, hey, 
we're not going to bow to your big stupid idol. But I'll tell you what, Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, you're not going to find us kneeling at that pathetic thing. You're going to find us in worship before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's able. He's able. And I think maybe we have conditioned our commitment sometimes only if God promises to come through. God has promised this. He will be God in your life. He may not come through the way you want him to come through. He's able to come through, but God is waiting and wanting and desiring a people to say, yeah, I know he's all powerful. He can do this, but I love him so much. And he's been so real to me, but even if he doesn't, hey, I'll tell you today, I'll tell you today, I'll testify today and I'll confess to this today. I was crushed. I was crushed when my dad passed away 28 years ago from cancer. And he was the textbook picture of faith. He was a good man. He was a great Christian. He was, he was awesome. And when God didn't heal him, I was so mad at God. I was so hurt and so disappointed because I expected God to show up the way I wanted God to show up. But eventually I had to get over that and get back to a place to say, God, I wanted my dad to get healed. He didn't get healed the way that I wanted, but I want to get back to the place, God, more than that. I want to get back to being the person, God. If you show up the way I want, party on. But if you don't show up the way I want, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to acknowledge you. I'm still going to claim you as my Lord and my Savior, regardless, unconditionally. And today, 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 he's able. He is able. He is able. We've got to leave that with him and just worship him unconditionally. But I love what this song says. I'm not going to deny what I know it can do. Here's the thing. I know this. Whether he does or whether he doesn't, he's got the power to do it. He's got all power. He's got all majesty. He's got all might. And we're going to sing this song one more time. And then I'm going to come back. And we're going to close this out. But maybe I preached this message to myself this morning just to get to this place. Because I've been saying, I hate to say it, but there's been times that I've been holding a grudge against God. Why didn't you? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? And God can't use a heart like that. In my dream, and I think it's like your dream, I just want to be all that God has called me to be. And for that to happen, your heart has got to be right. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seats and come on down around the front. We're going to turn this into a praise fest right now as we get ready to sing He is Able. Come on out. Come on down around. If, if you feel comfortable with that. But I think it's, it's something that God wants to do in our hearts. And I think it's something that God wants to do in this house. Here at Glendale. God is able. Take it away, Pastor Harrison.